Well, what you see on the screen now is a, a summary of our summer landowner webinar series. And what we've covered to date, uh, you see, is investing in farmland, investing with IRAs. We've also covered some beginning farmer and landlord incentive issues. Last week, we covered lease terminations and lease considerations for 2014. All of those are available on YouTube for you to watch at your convenience. So if you did not get to take part on those, or you did, and there's something you'd like to go back and listen to again, you can do that on YouTube. Today we're going to talk about the fall land market preview, and then next week our final episode will be on the Farm Bill update. Just a couple of things I want to mention. Everybody's on mute so that uh, we don't get any background noise. And if you have questions throughout the throughout the webinar today that you'd like us to answer at the end, just type them in. There's a there's a box uh, on your should be on your screen right down in here where you can type a, a question and and we'll uh, check those and get back to those at the end of the, at the webinar. So and for some reason now my screen's not advancing. Um, sorry, my PowerPoint here. Let me try it another way here. Okay. So my name is Ron Beach, and I'm director of separate account land management program here at People's Company. And also on the call helping today is uh, Steve Brewer, president of People's Company. And today we're going to talk about the land market here in Iowa. First, we're going to talk about trends in the value of farmland. We're going to take a look at both that from a historical perspective, and we're going to look at the present state of the market. And then we'll see what some of the most recent published surveys tell us has been happening. And then we'll talk about a few anecdotal uh, observations that we see in the most recent sales that are taking place in the market. After that, we'll take a look at some of the factors that are driving the land market, both some bullish factors that have driven it to the, these historic highs. Then we'll take a look at a few of the factors that could turn the market could turn the market bearish in the near future. And so those will be the bullish and bearish. Then we'll take a look at corn price and interest rates and how those interact to to help. Uh, uh, really drive the land market and, and what values are. And we'll take a look at how those uh, changes in those factors, any sustained changes in those factors, might, uh, might impact land values going forward. And then we'll sum up the webinar with some of our thoughts about the future of the farmland market. So here's the, here's the history of the farmland market in Iowa going back to 1950, the trend. You can see that uh, one thing I noticed, a couple things on this, is that the 70s and 80s seem to just be kind of a small blip in the in the trend, and then recently the the large spike. But if you overlay onto that on an inflation-adjusted basis, you get kind of a different story. You see that the 70s, late 70s, there, early 80s, were a much more significant factor once you adjust it for inflation. And then you can also see this this large spike we've had here in the last few years. It wasn't really until 2010 that we made back. Uh, we, where we actually set a historic high based on inflation. Prior to that, it had been set, set in the 1980. Another way to look at history is on this chart. It gives another perspective. This chart goes back to 1970, and it shows two components of the return to farmland, and that's its annual yield and its appreciation. This chart shows how those two have interacted during the past 42 years to create an average annual total return to farmland of 12.8%. Now on this chart, those blue bars, those bars are the annual return from the cash rent. And then the red bars show us that the appreciation of the, of the land, the value of the land from one year to the next. You, you'll note that in this time period, only eight years of those 42 did the red bar go below 0%, which is actually depreciation of 
of the value of land from one year to the next. The other 34 years all had gains. Now besides showing us that there's always an annual positive cash yield, that blue bar, which is always above zero on farmland, this also shows us that during times of rapidly increasing farm values, the cash yield gets squeezed down. In other words, what that's telling us is that cash rents don't keep up on the same percentage uh, with rising asset values. And you see that's what's happening now. If you look uh, through the, really through all the 2000s, that blue bar keeps going down while the red bars had some, um, some pretty fantastic increases. Now on the other side of that, when land values drop, the cash yields increase. Look in, the, look in the 1980s when land values were going down, cash rent, cash returns on, on land was actually going up and that's because uh, cash rents don't necessarily drop and they don't drop uh, in the same percentage as land does when it falls. So that's looking at the history. Now presently, uh, this was published by Iowa State at the end of last year the average statewide price of, of farmland of $8,296 an acre, up 23.7%. And here it is broken down by grade of land, high, medium, and low. And so those of you that look at the average that Iowa State comes out with at $8,296, you say, well, you can't believe that because nothing in your area either sells as high as that or you're in an area where nothing sells as, as uh, low as that. So this will give you a perspective as to why, because when talking averages uh, like, like that 8296, neither the grade nor the location really has very much relevance. The important perspective, I believe, is that all the grades, if you look at the percent in increase, they're all increasing at a very, a very similar rate. The next thing we want to do is let's take a look at where some of the experts, some of these surveys are telling us land what land has done and if they give us a clue as to where it might be going. The first one I looked at was Iowa State's their 23.7 percent rise from uh, from the fall of 2011 to the fall of 2012. This is the one they published last uh, late last year 23.7 percent. They survey uh, their survey takes into account actual land transactions Another one, the Chicago Federal Reserve, and the Chicago Federal Reserve District includes the state of Iowa, so they do a survey for Iowa. Now, they survey bankers and what bankers are telling them. And through that same time period, uh, they show an increase of 18%. Either way, those are, those are tremendous increases. Now, the Chicago Fed does this every quarter, so it's a rolling four-quarter average. So the next quarter, the calendar year of 2012, they're showing a annual increase of 20%, so a tick up in, the, in the, uh, the rate of increase. The next quarter, again, it held steady at a 20% annual, annual increase. And then this last quarter that just got published, they show only a 17% increase. So here, you might say it starts to look like it. Maybe the rate of increase is starting to, to moderate a little bit. Now, as I mentioned, the Chicago Fed does it on a quarterly basis, so I put in their lat each quarter what they showed. So the last quarter of 2011, it was up 6%. So going forward, the next quarter was 4, and then 2, and then 6, and then up to 8. And the last two quarters have been 3, and this, this last one finally was 0, a no increase in this last quarter. So if you look at this, you could conclude from that that the rate of increase is, is starting to, uh, to moderate or level out. Uh, interesting deal is on these last two quarters in 2013, this 3% and this 0%, uh, they break Iowa into five reporting districts. And in both of those, there were districts in Iowa that actually had a negative number for that quarter. And then this was the average for the state. Next survey I'd like to talk about is Farm Credit. They put out their benchmark survey every six months. Uh, they showed, just showed us that in the last uh, 12 months, we had a 21% increase, but in the last six months, it was only 6.3%. So that would tell us that, again, that the increase, the rate of increase is slowing. Still increasing, but, but not as fast. Realtor Land Institute. Here they survey 
real estate agents who are taking part in, in the land transactions throughout the state. They show that uh, in that time period, their, their last uh, report, that the two semi-annual reports added up to 17.1%. That was a 7.7% increase added to a 9.4% increase. Here, uh, for that period, looks uh, like things are pretty steady in that in that high teens to to 20 percent increase. And finally, the USDA came out with their survey showing 17.8 percent. So there's a lot of a lot of surveys there, but I think they all tell somewhat the same story: high teens, low 20s, a tremendous increase. Uh, the increase continues, uh, but perhaps it's starting to slow down a little bit. Now, since that time, um, well, first I'd like to mention that we've got surveys coming out. The Realtor Land Institute is presently surveying the, uh, their agents and their members, so that'll be coming out soon. Federal Reserve comes out every quarter, and then Iowa State's annual uh, will be published this fall, usually uh, late October, early November. So those will be the next big ones coming out to, to tell us what, uh, what might be happening. But we're also observing sales in the marketplace every week. And Steve, are you there? You want to make some comments about what's happening uh, most recently? Yeah, Ron. Um, a lot of these surveys that we're reciting here, some of them are you know, a year old and some of them are from the previous uh, quarters. But uh, we're following transactions on a daily basis. We, we attend various auctions throughout Iowa and other Midwest states. And what we're seeing right now is just an extremely choppy market. Uh, we're seeing some sales where there's still record high prices um, being paid in an auction environment, and then we're also seeing auctions where we're seeing just very limited bidder interaction and, in fact, some no sales. And so um, it's, it's similar to a, a grain market where it's looking for direction, and, and it's a little choppy right now where you don't know if the trend line is going to keep heading up or if it's going to head down. And so we're sitting in that time of year where uh, we don't know what the crop is going to look like, and we don't know where yields are going to settle in at. And so, if you're if you're a buyer, then this may be a buying opportunity because we are on a little bit of a dip. And in Iowa, where we we trade farms on these values per CSR point, um, we've seen some sales as low as 100 to 105 dollars a CSR point here over the last three or four weeks. And historically, over the last year or so, um, you know, high-quality farms have been in that 120 to 140 dollars a CSR point. So, and it's and it's not that you're not seeing some of these record-high sales, but it's really driven by the neighbors and the farmers that are buying right now. And if you if you take that neighbor and, and uh, the adjoining landowner and farmer out of the equation, then it, it gets a little weak. So, it's going to be interesting here over the next. Uh, month or two when the Realtors Land Institute comes out and Farm Credit and Iowa State comes out with their updated reports where the where the trends headed on land values. Okay, thanks Steve. Next, uh, just going to cover a few of the factors that that we see that are the bullish factors that are have been driving this land market and um, if these factors stay in, in place we'll continue to uh, to see some some positive increases in, in land values. And the first, obviously, is the record commodity prices and farm income, because the past several years, we've seen record incomes and resulting in the strongest farm balance sheets that, uh, you know, possibly ever. They're very strong, at least in, in several decades. And we've had record low interest rates, obviously. Uh, you know, the Fed's uh, quantitative easing is flooding the, flooding the economy with liquidity, and that continues to hold interest rates at, uh, at these unprecedented low levels. The um, renewable fuel standards has resulted uh, in a decade where we've seen the ethanol industry grow to where it's consuming 40 percent of the U.S. corn market. We've got uh, world uh, grain supply and demand issues in eight of the last 13 years worldwide production of grains and oil seeds has failed to meet the demand, and so that's resulted in the lowest inventories of food that we've seen in several decades. The next one, this uh, crop and revenue insurance, you know, it's creating a floor under farm incomes. It's a very effective product, uh, but that effectively creates a floor under land values and rents, and that's why despite a drought in 2012 with much lower 
uh, production, we still saw farm income and farmland investment continue to perform very well. And we've got advances in farm technology and equipment. This is allowing farmers to, to do more, to, uh, to be more efficient, to farm more acres. And so there's this competition for more acres as farmers become more efficient and use more of the, the technology in their farming operations. We've got worldwide demographics. We've got a population going from 6 billion to 9 billion people in the next 40 years. That equates to 219,000 miles to feed more on every day, on a daily basis. Uh, the world's more urban now than rural. We just passed that milestone, I believe, last year. And diets throughout the world are rapidly changing to, to uh, include higher levels, of, higher levels of protein. We've got uh, worldwide governments uh, everywhere cranking out uh, dollars and yens and euros and, and, uh, and pounds. And we've got U.S. banks who are sitting on two trillion dollars of excess reserves. And if it continues with quantitative easing, so that's driving inflation fears, and that's pushing a segment of investments into inflation hedging assets uh, such, as, such as farmland. And there's been a lack of alternative investments. Uh, you know, as investors look around to, to what they can get a return on with these low interest rates, uh, it's got a lot of them looking at, uh, looking at farmland. So that's, that's been driving uh, one of the one of the bullish factors. And then tax policy. You know, there's, the tax policy really incents people to hold land until they die because of the, um, the stepped up basis at that time. So that could be holding back uh, supply of land. So really the fundamentals are there and are in place that, for, that the demand for the production from farmland is continuing to rise around the world and cultivated acres per capita uh, have been declining for for a few decades now. But there's another side to that coin. There's the clouds on the horizon, the bearish factors. And start out with the same couple and we'll start out, commodity prices and farm income. Uh, you know, we still have price and production cycles in agriculture and these historic levels of prices and the resulting incomes won't continue and we're starting to see some of that now. Rising interest rates. Again, we've seen rates start to creep up just a little bit. I was at a symposium in July at the Chicago or the Kansas City Federal Reserve, and, and Esther George is the president of the KC Fed, and she said to watch the unemployment rate, and when it falls to six and a half percent, that will signal, and her words were, lift off of interest rates. So if you kind of want to know when interest rates might might go higher, watch that unemployment rate. And the closer it gets to six and a half percent, the uh, closer we are to seeing interest rates take off. We've got increasing cost of production, uh, break-evens on corn and soybean continue to rise, and it's not just the variable cost. We're also seeing fixed costs with with the new machinery and improvements that have been uh, adding to production cost, and and kind of like cash rents, it's hard to get that back on most of your inputs once those costs go up. We've got current record high price of ground, and, and I think Another one would be, you know, worldwide economies not being as strong as they have been. You know, there are clouds on that horizon. Weaknesses in those economies would slow demand and, and obviously neg negatively impact prices here in the U.S. Another one that is starting to get talked about more is, you know, they always say, you know, buy land. They're not making any more of it. Well, but there may be making there may be more acres coming into production. Uh, South America, Africa, former Soviet Union, Ukraine's a big one. They're all vigorously attempting to, to expand their domestic production. So, of course, they face a lot of hurdles uh, in doing that. You know, they've got infrastructure uh, problems and labor issues, government policy issues, and, and even corruption in some of those countries. But if they get it together, uh, there could be a significant 
number of acres uh, coming on worldwide, increasing supply. And then any increase in the value of the dollar it would negatively impact demand for our exports and impact our prices. And then these factors, you know, the worldwide direction of debt, deficit, and taxes of all these governments and the politicians' response uh, very well could result in continued recession, slow economic growth, and a drag on the entire economies, including the, the ag economy. We've got an aging landowner demographic that could potentially increase the supply of, of land on the market. And in Iowa, the recent, uh, Mike Duffy's recent survey that he does every five years on land ownership shows that 30% of the ground is owned by people who are 75 years or older and another 26% is owned by people who are 65 to 74. So that's 56% of the ground owned by people over 65. So in some fashion, that ground's gonna, gonna change ownership in the next 10 to 20 years. And then uncertainty around the farm bill, particularly crop insurance. You know, crop insurance was mentioned on the last slide as a, uh, as a bullish factor, so any changes that would uh, damage that product or make it less uh, um, you know, not as not as popular would would be a potential bearish factor for for farmland. So that's a lot of factors, both uh, uh, you know bullish and, and bearish. But let's look at a couple fundamental factors that we like to use to to uh, focus on land values, and that's the commodity prices or farm income and interest rates. So. Most of those other factors that we looked at, those bullish and bearish factors, really are, uh, in one way or another, influencers of supply and demand. And that all set out in the price of the commodity here. And then interest rates, uh, they impact not just borrowing costs, but you know, like we mentioned, low rates have had a significant impact on investment decisions and pushed people you know, looking for return into alter alternative investments like land. So that has a major impact on capitalization rates. So the uh, fundamental fa factor calculator that I call it goes, goes like this. You start out with $5 a bushel corn, and let's say you have 180 bushel per acre farm. That's $1,000 of gross income. You got 33 or third percent of that goes is a landlord share going for rent, so $333 rent. If you have a capitalization rate of 3%, that's a $10,000 an acre indicated price for, for a farm. Now if I can escape here and we'll go to here, and let's, let's run a couple other scenarios. Let's, uh, let's say corn, a little more optimistic on corn, think it's going to go back. It's going to be a $6 corn situation and our 180 bushel, we think we can sustain 200 bushel an acre. First of all, you saw when I changed that to, to $6 corn, let's go back here a second. When I changed that to $6 corn, that $10,000 an acre now went to 12. So now if we change uh, bushels to 200, now we got a $13,300 farm. And let's say, you know, Interest rates are low. I don't have anything else I can do with my money. I gladly accept, own a farm and accept a 2% return on my investment. Right there, that type of a scenario is how you can justify a $20,000 an acre farm. $6 corn, 200 bushel and a 2% return, and you can pay 200 or 20,000 an acre for, for that farm. Now let's uh, work backwards a little bit. Let's say interest rates start moving up and we get closer to 4.5%. See how far that dropped? Move that 2.5%, it dropped to $8,900 an acre. Let's go back to 180 bushel corn. I think that's more reasonable over the long term of this farm. 200 is just a little too aggressive. Now we're down to an $8,000 farm. And what if corn's going to be 4.5 bucks? instead of six. Okay, now we're at a $6,000 farm. You see how we went, started at a 10, we ratcheted up to a $20,000 farm and we took it right back down to a $6,000 farm. Uh, Steve, where were we, where, what would, uh, 
what would that take us back to? What year were, was the average farm in, in Iowa worth $6,000? You know, Ron, it seems like it was several years ago, but it was just 2011 when we were at um, high quality farm ground trading for around 6,000 an acre. So it's what's scary, and you know, a lot of folks talk about the lack of leverage being used for farmland purchases, and, and we see that in a lot of transactions, but what you see more often than not is that a landowner or a farmer will take a paid for 80 acre farm and put that as collateral to buy a new 80 acre farm. And some of the numbers that we've played around with internally, you know, if you pay $12,000 an acre for a new farm and you, and you pledge your pay for 80, now you owe, owe uh, $6,000 an acre against both farms. And it was just 2011 when those farms were worth $6,000 an acre. So it just doesn't take much uh, when you start playing around with the capitalization rate and the uh, price of commodities to take you back to 2011. Uh, and it's a little scary when you start playing around with these numbers. Well, and if you take, uh, I did a little uh, figuring. If you, we had the 8296, that was the average uh, uh, last November, and according to surveys, say it's up about a percent a month since then. That puts it up to about 9100. Uh, you know, that's a that's about a 30 percent decrease though to get back to that six thousand dollar range. So. You know that's a pretty significant decrease, and if that happens, um, um, you know, but that's only about a year and a half worth of the increase that we've seen. So it's a, you know, maybe a, a possibility. This next uh, thing I have up is the what I call the corn capitalization rate matrix, and this just gives you several of those uh, examples on one slide, and this assumes 180 bushel corn yield. And, a third of it going to the landlord. So you can see our original scenario, $5 corn at 3% cap rate, that $10,000 that $10, an acre farm. So you start increasing that cap rate, and uh, for every percent, you know, you're down about $1,500. Uh, well, you're down $2,500, then $1,500. So you just keep, that has a big impact, or if it goes down, it, it goes the other way. Then you drop Corn price from uh, five to four, and you've gone from ten thousand to eight. You drop down to four percent cap rate. You're down to six. So uh, it uh, it, um, it kind of gives you a feel for for the the risk associated with changes in those fundamental factors. Now, you know if corn is going to bounce around. Uh, it's going to be up, it's going to be down, and, and obviously land prices don't change on short-term rates. But any sustained sustained change in corn price and capitalization rates will eventually work into to land values. And that really those uh, that's kind of the information I want to present. I think Steve's going to walk us through. Uh, a summary of, of some of our thoughts on uh, on the fall land market and what, what might be coming up and what to look for. So Steve, you want to take over? Yeah, absolutely, Ron. Uh, Ron's done a, a great job sharing with us, you know, both the bullish side of the land market and, and also the bearish side and, and the trends that are impacting land values. And, you know, there's just so many factors that are out of our control. You see what's happening in Syria right now and, and the weather, if we got an early frost, now this corn market could jump back up to seven or eight eight dollars a bushel before you even knew what happened. And so you sit here and there's a lot of experts out there, including ourselves and others that want to make predictions on where the land market's headed. And at the end of the day, there's factors out there that are completely beyond anybody's control that are really going to dictate what happens. And so when we when we do these presentations, we like to point out the risk factors, and we also like to point out the positive factors that could impact the market and really help people make decisions for themselves in their own own time in life. And I get the question daily, you know, is now a good time to sell my farm or is now a good time to invest in farmland? And we continue to revert back to the, the time in life statement. And if you're a seller in the short term, then uh, right now is probably a good time to sell land. It's at a record time, record high price. 
and the window looks like it could be closing. If you do see a sustained commodity price decrease and you see interest rates start to climb, then your, your window to liquidate land in the short term is probably closing. And likewise, if you're a long-term owner of farmland, then right now, um, as Ron and I talked about earlier, there is a little bit of a blip in the market right now where there's probably some buying opportunities. If you can, if you can buy land below the trend line or below those $120 to $150 CSR point ranges that we were talking about, and you want to be a long-term owner of land, then now is probably a good time to buy land. And you, you have these meetings and you sound like a politician because you're saying that now's a good time to buy and now's a good time to sell. But it's really where you're at with your investments or your stage in life and, and what, uh, what you want to do. It's going to drive it more so than trying to time the market. And we talk about this internally. We've got about 30 land brokers and land managers in our office and we talk every day about where we think the land market's headed. I think we're all bullish long term. But in the short term, we feel like land values have been inflated due to historically low interest rates and historically high commodity prices. And so if you are a seller, then it probably is a, a good opportunity to look at, look at exiting. Um, the other thing that, that we're seeing right now is just a fundamental shift in attitude. And this is probably what scares, scares us more than anything. Um, since 2008, you couldn't pick up a Wall Street Journal or any uh, financial publication without looking at any sort of commodity setting record high land price or high prices. And what we're seeing now is just an overall shift in the attitude. Uh, we attend over 40 trade shows as a company where we exhibit at various functions around the country. And the speakers have started to turn from bullish about farmland to bearish. And you're seeing that in the media. Um, uh, just everywhere you look, you're starting to see a shift at the uh, farmland conference that Farm Bureau put on here a few weeks ago. Um, all the speakers just had a little negative tone about farmland values in their, in their speeches and their articles. There was a big article three weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal about the bloom coming off of the rose in farmland values. So um, when you start to see that attitude shift, that probably scares, scares you as much as anything. And on our slide here, um, I've got a bullet point, you know, that makes bankers grumpy when you see this commodity price pressure and higher interest rates. And and sometimes it's it's the attitude that dictates the value more so than even the economics behind it. And we're seeing that in a lot of transactions right now. When you when you take the farmer that's the neighboring landowner who has an emotional attachment to the land out of the equation, where are the investors really stepping up to the plate and what are they really paying for land? And more often than not it's a twenty or thirty percent um, difference from what the neighboring landowner or farmer is paying and where the investors are buying at. And so our big concern right now is where does this land market settle out uh, when the farmers quit buying and margins tighten, uh, you see a decrease in commodity prices and, and higher interest rates. So our, uh, our overall message is proceed with caution and if, if you are a buyer, um, try to buy buy right. If you're a seller, um, take advantage of the, the hot market and look for people that are still probably more bullish than you are as a, as a seller and, and try to take advantage of selling. And, you know, the, the saying we talk about in the office is don't fall in love with land because land can't love you back. And so um, it's easy to get emotional about purchases and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, um, it's got to make, make economic sense. And, and so we try to help people determine what, uh, would be a historically good number to pay for land. And if you can buy uh, below the trend line, then buy. And if you can sell above the trend line, then sell. And, and just do your uh, your own analysis and try to make educated decisions about it. So really, that's all I had, Ron, in, in closing. I don't know if you have anything you want to add in there, if you want to open it up for questions. But Yeah, why don't we do that? Uh, uh, were any questions typed in? I do have one. Here, um, I was asking about that matrix, um, the little, both the matrix and the, the uh, little calculator thing I used. Uh, yes, that's available. Uh, if you want a copy of that, just uh, you can see that um, my, my contact information there, either my phone number or just ron at peoplescompany.com. Let me know and I can send that out to you. Be glad to. Don't, uh, Anybody else? Let me take a look here. I don't 
see any questions. Okay, well, somebody turned to, so we don't have any. We'll, uh, we'll wrap it up then. Um, I just want to thank everybody for, for coming on. Uh, again, this, uh, this presentation, if you want to listen to it again or listen to it with somebody or make somebody aware of it, it will be available on YouTube next week. And we do have one more topic in our summer series, and that is on uh, uh, Farm Bill update. So I uh, hope some of you will tune in then. And just again, thank you for taking part. And good night.